All right, this continuation of the um, uh, second midterm version E, uh, we've done everything in class until the problem number 13. So here I'll just continue with the problem number 13. I will give you a chance to read this problem and to consider it first, and then we can discuss it a little more. All right, so what they're saying here is that the capacitor is initially uncharged. And this is the thing I need to remember. So what's happening here, we are charging this capacitor in this circuit. Okay. And uh, we need to answer which diagram would represent the dependence of uh, the current in the circuit as a function of time. Okay, very good. So what's happening like physically that we connected the capacitor to the battery, okay, um, and uh, what is happening is that the, uh, the charge is uh, pumped onto this capacitor, right? So, and while the capacitor is charged, right? So the initial capacitor charge was zero and then it will approach some non-zero value and it will stay constant after that. Okay, so while the capacitor is charged, there will be current in the circuit, of course. Oh, because the, the charge has to flow oh, from the battery, from the battery onto the capacitor, right? Um, but eventually, when the charge will reach its maximum value on the capacitor, which is defined by the capacitance, right? So you remember that uh, the charge, which can be stored on the capacitor, is related to the capacitance and the potential difference. We went through this one already, so I will not, uh, I will not talk about this once more. Okay, let me just remind you the equation C times... Um, the potential difference, right? So, so the capacitor here is connected to the to to to, to this potential difference and uh, to this battery, and therefore the there is maximum amount of charge for the capacitor uh, to be charged with, and this is that okay given by this equation. Anyway, so let me not uh, dwell into this any more any longer. So once. We know that once the capacitor is charged, there will be no current. So the only diagrams which would comply with that is the diagram three and the diagram two. Okay, diagram three and the diagram two. So this is where the current goes to zero at large times. So now in the diagram two, the approach of this current to zero is really abrupt, like, I don't know. So that's not possible, that's not physical. So let's forget about this. So, and this essentially we get the diagram number three where the approach to zero current is very, very uh, smooth. Okay, so, but we also can remember the, uh, the equation and the equation is given uh, over here. So, the current is given by its maximum value times the exponential. And when uh, t reaches uh, infinity, exponential gives you zero and this would correspond to this diagram. Okay, let's move on. Um, so here, uh, let's consider the next problem. It's number 14. Now, very similar, but now we need to find uh, something else. Uh, let, I will let you read it first. Okay. So again, we are charging the capacitor, but we are going to charge this capacitor to the 48% of its maximum value, maximum value, very good. So uh, a few things to remember that when we have a current, the current uh, flows from positive terminal to the negative terminal, okay? But uh, the conceptually one has to uh, also recall that actually the electrons travel in opposite direction to the current. Okay, you remember that Benjamin Franklin defined the current uh, in the following way is a motion of abstract or, you know, imaginary uh, positive charge. But you know that actual what flows in the metals are the electrons, or what we call also the free electrons, and they actually flow in opposite direction to the current. This is just a, uh, this is just a, a reminder about this conceptual uh, thing. But, I mean, for now, we don't need it over here. So what we have here is that the current flows um, and the charge flows to the capacitor and we charge the capacitor, we can remember that it will be driven by this equation. You can cross-check that when times goes to infinity, 
uh, the exponential doesn't contribute and uh, the charge will reach its maximum value q0. We can actually write down what q0 is, but for this problem we don't actually need it. Uh, so we have said that the charge at the given time which we need to define uh, reaches uh, 0.48 of its maximum value. Very good, let's just substitute this fact into this equation. And this equation is presumably in your equation sheet, right? So, okay, let's substitute this. I substitute it over here, and I see that on both sides of this equation I had Q0, so I would just cancel it. And this is why I didn't need to find this, because it just cancels, cancels in this equation. And then I will go through step by step solving this equation with respect to this time, okay? First, I subtract one from both sides. When I do um, this uh, for 0.48 minus one will give me negative 0.52. I hope I didn't do any arithmetic mistakes, no. Uh, all good, so now after this, I will flip the sign of both sides over here and I will take the natural log of both sides the natural log of exponent is just the argument, okay? And on the left, on the right-hand side, I will just have the logarithm of that number we had over here. Okay, and then I will solve for t. The t, the time, time is what I need to find. So it will be given by minus tau uh, times logarithm of 0.52. And now I the only thing I need to remember that the time constant for an RC circuit is given uh, by r times c, okay? Tau is given by r times c. Fine, this is what I will get at the end, okay? Minus r times c times logarithm of 0.52. The result, of course, has to be positive. Well, how do we achieve this positive result if we have a negative sign over here? Well, we have a logarithm of a number which is below one and that logarithm is negative. One you once you substitute the numbers and now, on the right hand side we know here everything once you substitute the numbers you'll get you will get a number in seconds okay just just compute substitute and compute everything is uh, in the science already okay i didn't do this calculation i'll let you do this uh, find the answer and cross check this answer with uh what you have in the posted uh key for that midterm Let's move on uh, to the 15. Okay, so here we have a battery EMF uh, with a given voltage and we need to find the current I3. Okay, when I actually see a problem like this, um, there are multiple ways to solve it. We can use Kirchhoff's rules, we can uh, just simplify the circuit first, but when there is one battery, so most of the time I can just simplify the circuit before proceeding with that. And also I can see that, for example, this part, these are the, uh, the resistors which are connected in parallel. Once I simplify it, I will see that the equivalent resistor or equivalent resistance of the combination of two is connected uh, in series with this one. I will also be able to simplify it, okay? So here Kirchhoff's rules are not important uh, to deal with. Now there is a there is a more straightforward way to solve this problem and it's just by simplifying it first. Sometimes the resistors are connected in such a way that you cannot simplify the circuit. I think we will have something like that um, in a little bit, but I mean, in this case, you, you can recognize it. it can be simplified and using Kirchhoff's rules will be an overkill, but you can still do it, of course. Anyway, so here, uh, as I said, many ways to solve this problem. So. So there is only one EMF, so most probably uh, just simplifying the circuit would be sufficient. And I can also immediately recognize that these guys are connected in uh, parallel. Since they're connected in parallel, I can use this equation for the equivalent resistance for this uh, couple. Okay, so it's 12 times 12 divided by 12 plus 12 ohms, right? But you have an actual equation for the resistance which are you know, connected in, in, in parallel, right? So, and I get six ohms, okay. So this is six ohms, uh, this part. And uh, so this resistor somehow appeared on the, on the top in my next diagram. So when I see that these now are connected in series and therefore to find the equivalent resistance is pretty straightforward. I just said 15 and six and I get 21 volt. Very good. So now I need to find this current I3, but this is the same current as shown over here. So it's the same 
current is the current through the entire circuit because it's the current you know, through the battery. Okay, so and to find this uh, current, what I need to do, I need to take the EMF and divide by the equivalent resistance, right? Which I just found 21 ohms. So that substituted the numbers. You compute, you check, uh, you cross check with the key. Okay, very nice and very straightforward problem. Okay, so next point, next problem one is 16. Okay, I will let you look at it. So what's given here, let me just walk you through that. So I2 currently here and I3 is given um, and I4 is given, although it wasn't drawn over here in the diagram, but I4 is actually 14 amps. So here it's written. Okay, so these are the givens. Okay, what I need to find, I need to find the current I1. And you see, so and this is one of these examples when you would like to think, well, let me just simplify the circuit. And you will not be able to simplify that circuit because uh, uh, all these resistors connected neither in parallel nor in series. So, and for that, uh, we need to use the Kirchhoff's uh, current node rules. So for node A, uh, which is indicated over here, uh, we have the following rules, all right? So the sum of all incoming currents, in this case, the only one incoming current, which is indicated in coming into that node, right? So this is flow of this imaginary positive charge, okay, into that node. Okay, so the only one incoming current here is I1. So what are the outgoing com currents? So it equal, so I the incoming, sum of the all incoming currents equals the sum of the outgoing currents. So what are the outgoing currents? It's I5 and I4. I5, I actually indicate myself here for simplicity, okay? So I5 and its direction is shown over here. Okay, I5 plus I4. Very good. So now let's also consider node B. So it's the other node which you know, essentially involves the knowns here and one unknown I5, which I recently introduced. Okay, so what we have is the sum of the incoming currents. Well, the incoming current is I5 into that node uh, and I3 into that node. So I, I5 plus I3, what's outgoing current from that node is the only one, it's I2. Mm, over here. Okay, and after this, I can solve the last equation for I5. It's I2 minus I3, I2 is given, I3 is given, and I'll get five amps. And after that, I will use this I5, substitute it over here, and I will be able to find the I1 current, right? From node A, it's 5 plus 14, uh, and it's 19. Okay, so 18. Uh, so as a matter of fact, so quite recently, so you probably heard, uh, uh, um, you know, noticed like a lot of uh, um, post about neural network and there is like neural network which can write a poem but certain things you can just tell it uh, to write a poem about you know it's the subject of your interest or you can ask you know what Alice in Wonderland would think about you know, some you know, you know political issues and it would actually also speculate about this no anyway so it's pretty pretty interesting so uh, and I actually tried this neural network on a couple of physics problems and I actually specifically tried on this one uh, and it does solve it right. It's pretty amazing. With some problems, it, uh, it does fail. Uh, but, you know, given the fact that it was not tailored to solving physics problems, it's quite amazing what it can do. So it's approximately, yeah, scores 90% um, on the problems I fed to it. Uh, of course, I can't feed a problem with a diagram like this, but on the problems like this, where it's only the uh, wording, it's it's extremely, extremely good. Again, so it's not perfect, it makes mistakes, and those mistakes by them, by itself are actually spectacular. I mean, I I have to say I learned a lot, a lot from uh, the neural network making mistakes rather than from it solving it in the right way. It's just like, it just... Uh, understanding how it fails is um, is magical, okay? Anyway, so let me consider this problem. So we have a sun emitting protons. I think we actually saw something like that very recently, but by all means, we need to use the right hand rule, right hand rule. So this is a proton and therefore we do not have any tricks 
about flipping the direction of the magnetic force, but the right hand rule is for you to help. You need to point your hand and fingers first in the direction of the velocity, then you bend your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, and your thumb will define the direction of the magnetic force. If you don't remember that, first of all, there is a file posted on Moodle, uh, which defines your all possible right hand rules uh, we used in that class. Um, and maybe you can go back and watch the video uh, on that subject, let's say pre-class video. Uh, so this is probably was about magnetic force uh, and its direction. Okay, 17s. So at 17s, it's uh, again, this word, word uh, problem over here. So a battery with an EMF of 15 volts and internal resistance is connected to a single load uh, with resistance 2.2 ohms. What is the terminal voltage of the battery? So let me draw the diagram. So that's the diagram. So this is my battery over here. Okay, positive, positive, and negative terminal, internal resistance. So the terminal voltage of the battery is the voltage, well, across these points, across the entire battery, okay? Okay, so how do I find the terminal voltage? Well, I need to find the current first, uh, to find the potential difference between these two points. I need to find the current, right? And then to do that, I need to find the equivalent resistance of the circuit. Well, the equivalence resistance of this circuit, I see that these two resistors are connected in series, and therefore the equivalent resistance is pretty straightforward to find. It's given here. Okay, so from here I will be able to find the current. It will be the EMF divided by this equivalent resistance. Okay, this is not what I need to find. I need. I actually need to find at the end of the day the terminal voltage and the terminal voltage is this potential difference over here. Let's uh, actually show the direction of this potential difference like this. So this uh, direction of potential difference coincides, right? So this is part of this direction of potential difference in the battery. Okay, so that's the direction of potential difference. And this is what I need to show uh, to to, uh, to solve for is delta V B A. Well, I mean, I will just use the Kirchhoff's rules here. So E epsilon, has the same part, uh, has the same direction of the potential difference. Uh, the EMF has the same potential direction of potential difference as the one I'm trying to find, and therefore it will contribute with a positive sign. Now uh, the current goes this way, right? And the potential difference across the resistor is always opposite to the direction of the current, and therefore you'll have minus here and the potential difference across the resistor, which we know how to find. It is the current times the resistance, okay? And now I can substitute my current over here. At any point, by the way, you can actually compute the number here, the number here, okay? So, and then you will be dealing with the numbers. I will be dealing with equations here. So I will just substitute the current here. It's epsilon over R equivalent. And then I will remember what R equivalent is uh, and simplify this expression by pulling out uh, epsilon here. And this uh, will get the final result in this uh, equation form, I will substitute the numbers and get, and you know, the final result. Okay, again, so at any point, at any stage of solving this problem, you can actually deal with numbers if you're more comfortable with numbers. Okay, no, I prefer to use the equations. Uh, anyway, so uh, after that, you're essentially done. So you substitute and compute and you check, of course, with the key. Okay. Now let's move to 19. I'll give you a chance to read it. All right, so we have the loop. How many terms does this loop have? One, so n number of terms is one. Okay, so what about the current in this loop? Uh, it's given over here. What about the magnetic field? This loop is placed uh, in uh, uh, it's over here, 0.6 Tesla. Uh, so what about the area of the slope? Well, the area is not given, but the side of this loop, it's rectangular one, and its side is defined, it's 0.15. Well, the side is known, let's call it length of that side. We can find the area, it's length squared, so it will be 0.15 meters squared, right? So that number squared. Okay, so now, now we know what equation we need to apply to find the torque. It's number of turns times the current 
times the area of the loop, times the magnetic field, times sine of the angle, of the angle between what and what. This angle is between the normal to the face of that loop, which would coincide, so that face of that loop would coincide with, well, with the page or the screen or whatever you have. Okay, so, and the normal vector will be perpendicular to that face of that loop, okay, perpendicular. And this is where I indicate it, over here. Okay, so what theta here is, so it's the angle between this vector perpendicular to, well, this page, right? It doesn't matter if it goes in or out here, so I indicate this as uh, going out of the page. Okay, um, and it is, uh, it forms 90 degrees with the magnetic field, and this is what I'm going to use. So for theta 90 degrees, sine of 90 degrees is one, uh, n is also one, I is given, A we just found, B is given, substitute compute. Okay, check the result with the key. I also consider here the magnetic force and its direction when I was defining the direction of this torque. Okay, you can do it as well. Um, so again, so you define the force on this, uh, uh, on this uh, piece of the wire, you define the force on this piece of the wire, you can cross-check yourself that uh, here you'll get uh, the force which is directed into the page, here it's out of the page. Well, check it, just um, to make sure that uh, you understand uh, uh, these concepts as well and try to handle Okay, so let's move on to 20, I'll give you a chance to read it. Okay, so we have a current here, we have magnetic field um, of given direction, we need to find the magnetic force per unit length and um, the magnetic uh, force uh, direction. Okay, so for magnetic force direction, what we do, we place our hand okay, and arm, everything essentially, uh, in the direction of the current, then we turn the arm in such a way as we can uh, bend the fingers so that they would point in the direction of the uh, of, of the uh, of the magnetic field and our thumb then will define the direction of the magnetic force and in my case so well i did that exercise and i see that it will be directed into the page here okay so it's west okay very good so this is either this or or that answer um to find the uh, magnetic force per unit length of the wire. We had an equation, uh, which I also indicated over here. And uh, so here I have the current, um, I have magnetic field, I have sine of the angle between the current and the magnetic field. Well, in this case, uh, this angle is, uh, so that angle, right? So this is 40 degrees. Okay, so this is 40 degrees but I'm looking at this angle, so this is 180 minus 40, so it's 140 degrees, so that's the angle. Substitute, compute, compare with the key. That's the last one. Uh, thank you very much.